The Quran would never affect our hearts unless we reflect. Just reciting the Quran, it will have an effect on our hearts, but very slight and slim effect. But if you really want to get the benefit from the Quran, you really need to ponder and reflect upon every verse by itself. The effect will happen to you and will last with you forever. To deliver his talk before all of us today on the topic, Impact of the Quran on the Hearts, brothers and sisters, please welcome Dr. Mamdu Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Dr. Mamdu Muhammad, born in Egypt, has had a master's and a PhD obtained from the George Mason University in USA. He has had 30 years of experience in teaching Arabic to English as well as in some period to the Indonesian speaking students. He is currently a professor and consultant at SAIS, John Hopkins University, and the academic advisor at the American Open University in Virginia, USA. He has been an instructor at the Imam Muhammad Islamic University in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, and has also taught in Indonesia. Dr. Mamdu has a keen interest in the sciences of the Quran and on the seerah of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He is a regular speaker at worldwide Islamic conferences and has all his publications, which include an A to Z guide on Hajj and Umrah, Existence of God, Is the Quran the Word of God, Shortcuts of Paradise, The Meaning of Islam, and the Purpose of Life. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna alhamdulillah nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nu'minu bihi wa natawakkalu alayhi wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina man yahdihi allahu fahuwa al-muhtadi wa man yudlil falan tajid lahu waliyan murshida wa ashhadu an la ilaha illa allah wahdahu la sharika lahu lahu al-mulk wa lahu al-hamd yuhyi wa yumit wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir huwa l-awwal wa l-akhir والظاهر والباطن وهو بكل شيء عليم وأشهد أن نبينا محمدا عبده ورسوله أدى الأمانة وبلغ الرسالة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في سبيل الله حق جهاده وتركنا على المحجة البيضاء ليلها كنهارها لا يزيغ عنها إلا هالك اللهم صلي وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا ثم أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam I greet you with the best greeting that had been ever known to humanity السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته My topic as you've just heard from my presenter is about the impact of the Quran. It is full of details, it has many minute issues in it. I will try to classify it in such a way to get an imprint in your brains, inshallah. I will talk about the impact of the Quran on humans and non-humans and on inanimate objects. Again, I'll talk about the Quran, the effect of the Quran on humans, and these humans are classified into two categories, the believers and non-believers, and I will talk about the effect of the Quran on non-humans, and I will talk about the effect of the Quran on inanimate objects. Now, let's start with one of the descriptions of the Quran that had been made by a non-Muslim Arab 
and he heard the Quran for the first time, then he mentioned this beautiful description that I hope that you can memorize it. He said, Wallahi, as you know that the Arabs used to believe in Allah, the problem of the Arabs was not believing in Allah. The problem of the Arabs before Islam was associating someone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, associating idols with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Wallahi, inna lahu lahalawa, wa inna alayhi latalawa, wa inna a'lahu lamuthmir, wa inna adnahu lamuthmir, ya'lu wa la yu'la alayhi. Again, he heard the Qur'an for the first time, then he stated these beautiful words. An unbeliever of the Qur'an. I swear by Allah that it has sweetness, and it's coated by sweetness, and the top of it is fruitful, and the bottom of it is fruitful, and it goes high and high, and nothing can go higher than the Qur'an. When you know that the Arabs at that time excelled in Arabic, they had nothing to do in their life except to make poetry. So they reached the level that they perfected the language very much. So instead of me speaking to you in prose, one of the Arabs at that time would come in front of you and would make all his lecture in poetry, which is a very high level of a language. Now let me start with the effect of the Qur'an on the believers. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described this situation in the Qur'an, He mentioned, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وإذا تتلى عليهم آيات الرحمن خروا سجدا وبكيا When the verses from Allah from the merciful, from Ar-Rahman, are recited upon them. When they hear them, they fall down, they make prostration, they make sujood, and they cry in their sujood. So this is one of the effects of the Qur'an on the hearts of the believers. It makes their hearts being affected and touched by the beauty of the Qur'an to the degree that they remember Allah and they cry in their sujood. And also, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in another verse, describing the believers, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إنما المؤمنون الذين إذا ذكر الله وجلت قلوبهم وإذا تليت عليهم آياته زادتهم إيمانا وعلى ربهم يتوكلون the verse says that when indeed the believers, the true believers are the one, when the name of Allah is mentioned to them, their hearts shiver and quiver. And when the verses of Allah are recited to them, it will increase their belief, their faith. So another effect of the Qur'an on the hearts, it increases the belief of the believers. And here is we will take the best of the believers, who is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam himself. And here is the effect of the Qur'an upon him. One time the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was walking, and there was a woman sitting on the street. She was just reciting the Qur'an, reviewing her memorization. And she was reading the verse of Al-Ghashiyah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم هل أتاك حديث الغاشيه وجوه يوم إذ خاشعة عاملة ناصبة Immediately the Prophet ﷺ was walking. He stopped. He could not continue when he listened to these verses. Unlike a lot of Muslims nowadays, when they hear the verses of the Qur'an, they would say, this is addressing someone else. When you hear a verse from the Qur'an, you should know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses you. In particular, 
by the verses. It's not an obsolete book that was sent to the time of the Prophet ﷺ and his companions, and that's it. No. Every verse of it, it addresses each one of us. And this is one of the signs, by the way, if you want to test your belief or not. When you hear a verse, and when you try to disregard it or ignore it, you know that there's something wrong with your heart. And you have to open it up. And the only way to open it up is only by the Quran itself. Then the Prophet ﷺ could not resist the temptation of responding to the woman. And he stopped and he said, Naam atani, Naam atani. She was reciting the verse that says, Have you heard about the news of the Day of Judgment? al ghashiyah Have you? Have you? Yes. So there would be no excuse. Almost in every two pages, if not in every page, there is a direct mention of the Day of Judgment. One of the description of the Day of Judgment. al haqqa and so on and so forth. So there would be no excuse for us to say we have not heard the news about the Day of Judgment. And the Prophet ﷺ, when he said that, he started crying. So this was the effect of the Qur'an upon the heart of the best believers on the earth. He loved also, when you know the Qur'an, you love to hear it from those who recited very good. Try to imagine how beautiful this recitation of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ was. Even though, whenever he used to see and meet Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he would stop him and he would ask Ibn Mas'ud, one of his companions, to recite the Qur'an to him. And Ibn Mas'ud would feel shy of himself. How can I read the Qur'an to you, or you, Messenger of Allah? And you are the one who brought the Qur'an to us. And the Prophet ﷺ used to say, I love to hear it from you. And Ibn Mas'ud starts to read. And he read this verse, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. فَكَيْفَ إِذَا جِئْنَا مِنْ كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ بِشَهِيدٍ وَجِئْنَا بِكَ عَلَى هَؤُلَاءِ شَهِيدًا What is the situation when we will bring one witness from every nation and will bring you Muhammad as a witness upon all these nations on the Day of Judgment? You can imagine when he finished this, Ibn Mas'ud looked at the Prophet ﷺ and his tears almost wetted all his beard because the meaning of the verse that he will be a witness upon all those human beings on the day of judgment and try to imagine what type of responsibility the Prophet ﷺ would have at that time there are many verses in the Quran but this is not my main focus here I will focus on the effect of the Quran on the non-believers there's in the early days, a story of those people who were asked by the leaders of Quraysh to monitor the Muslims in the early days of Islam. So they used every night to send one of them to see what the Muslims were doing. They were tracking them, in other words, spying on them. So it was the turn of someone whose name was at tufail ibn Amr al-Dusi from a very famous tribe in Arabia, it's called Daus. So they asked him to go and listen. First they asked him to observe what they were doing. And they advised him, do not approach them so closely in order to avoid listening to what Muhammad said. And they told him, Basically, if you listen to it, you will be affected by it. So it's the best thing for you to put dough. This is cotton. It's dough. You know donuts? Do you know donuts? 
the dough before it gets nuts. Okay, it's the hajin. So they advised him to put something like donut, like dough, like cotton, in his ears in order to prevent to prevent him from listening to the recitation of the Prophet ﷺ. Then the guy did. He put the door, he approached the Muslims, and then he found, he saw the Prophet ﷺ reciting the Qur'an. So then he asked himself, why I am behaving like a child? I am not so stupid. Let me listen to the guy. Let me listen to what he says. If he said something good, I will take it. If he said something bad, I will not take it. So he took the dough out. Then he listened to the beautiful recitation of the Prophet ﷺ. I'm not going to tell you exactly what happened. But when he went back to his people, the leaders of the Kuffar Quraysh, when they saw him from distance, they said the man came with a different face. Meaning, the man became a Muslim. He went with the face of a kafir, but his face was so affected by the recitation of the Quran that it appeared on his face. And you can see this by your eyes, by the way. You see the effect of the Quran, the effect of the Iman on the faces of the Muslims. How many times you meet some people in the airport or in any place that's crowded and you can distinguish some Muslims even if you don't know that they are Muslims it is the effect of the Quran on their faces alhamdulillah and this is a blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for us there is uh, one of the famous authors of books and he is a professor at uh, Minnesota University in the United States his name is Caesar Farah he wrote a book called Islam it had been going on and used in many universities in the United States and other countries as well and among the beautiful things that he wrote about Islam he's not a Muslim he said that this Quran does not make only women cry and only men cry but he makes the toughest men on the earth cry such as Umar ibn Khattab anhu, and many others. He said that the strongest men on earth, when they are affected by the Quran, they cannot stop themselves from crying. And he said no other book on the earth has this effect on the hearts. There's another story that perhaps some of you heard about it. There was a group of Muslims traveling on a ship to the United States and the time of Salat al-Jum'ah came. So one of them gathered the few Muslims who were on the ship and he started making a khutbah and then he prayed Salat al-Jum'ah and the tourists all of them gathered around to see what was going on as uh, an issue of curiosity but then after that when he finished his Salat a woman approached him uh, from Czechoslovakia and told him you were speaking of course he was speaking in Arabic in the khutbah but after the khutbah while you were standing and making ruku'ah and making sujood she didn't know that this is called salat you said something different in a different language he said no no it was, in, it was Arabic she was referring to the Quran to the recitation of the Quran she said no no it sounded to me it's totally a different language the one that you recited in your prayer it was Arabic, both of them are Arabic, the khutbah was in Arabic, and of course the recitation of the Qur'an was in Arabic. But a non-Arabic speaking disbeliever could distinguish the verses from, of the Qur'an than the verses of Arabic language without knowing anything about the Qur'an before. Again, this is the effect of the Qur'an on the hearts of non-believers. There is a very famous story mentioned in uh, the sealed nectar the very famous book of seerah by al mubarak Fori. he said the prophet sallallahu one time in the early days of the meccan period he was in the kaaba and the kuffar were scattered here and there standing with each other talking socializing then the prophet sallallahu rose up and then he started reciting this verse, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, 
والنجم إذا هوى ما ضل صاحبكم وما غوى وما ينطق عن الهوى I just want you to try to imagine the beauty of the voice of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and it's everybody kept silent looked at the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam they listened attentively to what he was saying until he reached the end of the surah أَفَمِنْ هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ تَعْجَبُونَ وَتَضْحَكُونَ وَلَا تَبْكُونَ وَأَنْتُمْ سَامِدُونَ فَعْبُدُوا لِلَّهِ وَاسْجُدُوا Prostrate down, as the verse says. Immediately, those Arabs fell down and they made prostration being affected by what the Prophet ﷺ said. They could not control themselves when they listened to the verses after a long time, when the verse said, make sujood to Allah, although they were kuffar, they could not resist this and made sujood. And when all of a sudden, they discovered that they had been affected by the words of the Quran. Unconsciously, they could not control themselves. As for me, I had many experiences, personal experiences in the effect of the Quran. Before I say that, I will give you the story, another story before my personal experience. It's a story of an engineer. I heard this story almost 30 years ago. I'm not gonna tell you how many 30 years I have. Uh, mentioned by a Kuwaiti Sheikh on a tape that I still have it with me. He said that there was one Kuwaiti engineer studying in the University of Arizona. He was studying engineering and it was the time of exams. And the paper was distributed among the students and they looked at it and the exam was very difficult. So everybody was nervous. Then the Kuwaiti Muslim brothers, among all those 30, 35 students who were non-Muslims, this Kuwaiti engineer asked his professor, he said that I have a tape. If I play the tape, it will cool the students down. Do you mind? And the professor said, no, go ahead and play the tape. Then he started playing the tape. It was Surat Ar-Rahman. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. Ar-Rahman. Allama Al-Qur'an. Khalaq Al-Insan. Allama Al-Bayan. And the verses went as smoothly as you know this verse. And every student cooled down. They started answering the paper. Then after probably 13 or 14 minutes, the tape stopped. Then everybody looked at the Kuwaiti student and asked him to replay the tape again. Brothers and sisters, I hope you understand the significance of this story. They could not resist the beauty of the Quran. It comforted them. They didn't understand a single word. But this is the effect of the Quran upon their hearts. And they were non-believers. The final story that I'll mention in this section is my own experience in George Mason University. One of the students called me, there was an activity by the MA students and they asked me to deliver a speech. They gave me one hour before the speech. Students always do that, I hope you don't. I had another lecture anyway, so I asked one of the students to make this experiment. I told him to go to the translation of Quran and to go to the Bible, basically the translation of the Bible in English. And I told him, you select three verses from the Quran and three verses from the Bible. And to be neutral, I want you to go, for example, to page number 200 in the Quran and to get a verse and to go to the page 200 in the Bible and to get another verse and to go to page 400 and to get a passage and to get from the Bible the same thing, from the same page. And the same thing with the third text. I did not know which verses that he selected. I was busy teaching my lecture then. Immediately I went to the lecture and he put them in on a transparency. Three from the Quran and three from the Bible. And there were a lot of audience, probably 200 something students. The majority of them were non-Muslims. Then I said, each one of you would get ready and tell us, to your best knowledge, which column 
would tell you that these are the words of God. I didn't tell them that this is from the Quran or from the Bible. And I was crossing my finger, meaning that I was afraid. <laughs> I didn't exactly know which verses he selected until I saw the verses, of course. Then wallahi, I swear by Allah, all the students, Muslims and non-Muslims, they selected the columns that were from the Quran. Then I had it an opportunity. I invited each one of them to come to the podium to say, why did you have this feeling? Every one of them was trying to express himself in a way, but he said that this is the effect that I got on my heart, that these are the words of Allah. Although this is not the Arabic language, this is not the exact text of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, still the effect was there. And this is the lesson that I want you to understand from this story. I want you to get from this story, this lesson, that no matter how eloquent you are in speaking, don't ever think that it is your speech that affects the people. Indeed, it is the words of the Quran that affects the people. And that's why this is an advice for all of us. It's the more you use verses of the Quran in your presentations, the more effect it will have on the hearts. Now let's move to the third effect of the Quran on non-humans. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the angels, created the human beings, created the jinns. And as you know that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a messenger to us and to the jinn. And there is a whole verse in the Quran. It's called Surah Al-Jinn. And listen to even the jinn when they heard the Quran, uh, they were affected. And these are the words of the jinn. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim. Qul uhiya ilayya annahu istama'a nafarun min al-jinn faqalu inna sami'na Qur'anan ajaban yahdi ila al-rushd fa'amanna bihi. They said that we listen to an amazing Qur'an. It just guides your heart to the truth. And immediately when we listen to it, we accepted it. We believed in it. And not only that, by the way, the second effect was on their heart is when they took the message and they started inviting the other jinn to Islam after they became Muslims. Now, the final effect of the Quran is on the inanimate object. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in a couple of verses in the Quran, and this is one of them, A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajeem. Try to imagine the Rocky Mountain in the States or the Himalaya here. Try to imagine had Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Quran down on these mountains, what would happen? As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله وتلك الأمثال نضربها للناس لعلهم يتفكرون قل ميت الله سبحانه وتعالى said had we sent down the Quran on a mountain full of strong rocks, you will find the impact and the magnitude of the Qur'an on this mountain by making it calm, quiet, then it will fall apart into pieces being affected by the words of Almighty Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, we give you these parables and these examples so that you would reflect upon them. And this is the key word that I want you to get from this lecture. The Quran would never affect our hearts unless we reflect, unless we think on the meaning of these verses. Just reciting the Quran, it will have an effect on our hearts, but very slight and slim effect. But if you really want to get the benefit from the Qur'an, you really need to ponder and reflect upon every verse by itself. Even if you spend 
one hour on one verse to understand it, the effect will happen to you and will last with you forever. And this is an invitation for all of you to study the language of the Quran. No matter how many translations you would read of the Quran, it will not give you the same effect as you know the original language. And you know some of the secrets of the language that will have this effect. Let me give you one of these beautiful aspects of Arabic that would help you reflect upon the Quran. One quality of Arabic language is that the verb can be repeated, the same verb can be repeated, combined together of the repetition to form a new word. What is that? Like the word was, wasa, as, asa, dam, dama, zel, zela. Do you know these words in the Quran or not? The most famous one is Zalzala. There is a whole chapter in the Quran. It's called Surah Az Zalzala. So Zal means shake. Zal is another shake. So when you put them together, it becomes Zalzala, continuous shaking. And that will what will happen on the day of judgment. A continuous earthquake that will continue on and on and on and on and on until everything on the earth is leveled down. The mountains, the skyscrapers, the high buildings, everything will be leveled with the earth. Try to imagine how strong the earthquake will be. So it's not the translation of Surah Zalzala is not a normal earthquake. You understand this from the repetition of the two words beside each other. It will continue until the end of life on the earth. Try to see the effect of this on your heart when you compare it with just a word, earthquake. Another word is the waswasa, which means to whisper. And this is one quality of the shaitan, waswasa which tells you something significant, that the shaitan will always and continuously whisper in you until you die. There will never be a time, this is what the language implies and what we know about the shaitan. The shaitan will always whisper to you and to me and to every believer all the time until we die. Continuous whisper, day after day, even if you memorize the Quran. Even if you do all the salawat, the more you become a good person, the more the Satan will be waiting for you because he wants to deviate you. You understand these beautiful things when you reflect upon the verses. And there is no way that you can find these issues in the translation. Now, let me tell you the description of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself of the effect of the Quran on the hearts of the believers. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم and this is in سورة الزمر الله نزل أحسن الحديث كتابا متشابها مثانيا تقشعر منه جلود الذين يخشون ربهم ثم تلين جلودهم وقلوبهم إلى ذكر الله ذلك هدى الله يهدي به من يشاء so this is now the description from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describing the effect of the Quran on the believers. And he called it, this is the guidance of Allah at the end, which is really very significant. He said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down the best speech. Ahsan al-Hadith. Kitaban, referring to the Quran. So now, just save your time. Save your time. Why do you spend a lot of time reading nonsense such as newspapers and magazines? For example, it takes me less than two minutes to read a newspaper because it's not worthy to spend more than that. It takes me probably five minutes to go over a magazine because I know that there is a book that has better speech than this. 
And this is something important for all of us to know that we are a product of the input that comes to us. If you open my brain or his brain or your brain and put it inside you, you will find wonders. You will find probably 50% from the media and 50% from the Quran and the Sunnah. Even if you reach this level which is considered a very, very high balance nowadays, you are at risk. You are at risk. Why? Because it's 50-50 in your brain or in your heart. What happens is one time you get a response from this 50 and one time you get a response from this 50. In other words, you behave 50% as a non-believer and 50% as a believer. Because these concepts and ideas are in our hearts. The only way to be on the safe side is when you make the input that we get from the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ much more than the input you get from other sources. You have to check this every day in order to guarantee that you will behave as the Prophet ﷺ and his companions behaved. It is a very difficult task. I'm not saying it is impossible. It is difficult, but you can do it. Because anything that you get from other sources, it will make you behave like those people who gave you this input. Whether it's the news or the TV or your teachers or even sometimes your parents. Not everything that we hear from our parents is pure Islam. A lot of it sometimes is mixed with culture especially if we live in a culture, in a multi-level culture, culture that has many cultures in it. So what we need to do is to get from the Qur'an the amount that we need to survive Islamically and to make it dominate our brains so that every time there is a situation and we want to respond to this situation an Islamic response would come. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Allahu nazzala ahsan al hadith kitaban. If it is the best speech, why waste your time? Why waste your time and explore other things that they are not beneficial? I wish you do this with yourself and review what you have in your brain. And he described it as a book, as mutashabihan which means that there are some of the verses are similar to each other. And you will find it uh, sporadic in the Quran. And then he said, Mathania. Mathania, that means is repeated, referring to Al-Fatiha, because we use it repetitively. And he said, the effect of this book and this speech on you is that it will make your skin goose pumping. Do you know what I'm saying? The goose pumping when you, yes, you are scared. This happens because of two reasons. Either because it's too cold or you are too afraid. This goose pumps happen in your skin. Then, this is one quality, so it makes you scared. And if you're not scared, you will not be scared of the Day of Judgment. It's one wisdom before behind it. Day of Judgment is that to make you scared, because if you are scared, you are not going to do the sins that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prevented you from. When he said, الَّذِينَ يَخْشَوْنَ رَبَّهُمْ Those who have those goosebumps, only those who are mindful and they fear Allah. So you understand that if you don't have this goosebumps sometimes when you understand the verses, there is a problem and you need to work on it. It only affects those who fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then after this process happens, their skins become softer and their hearts become softer. And this is the effect of the Quran. It makes the strong and the hard hearts softer and softer. And as you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala threatens in many places those who have tough hearts.
And one of the things that would make our hearts smooth and soft is crying. Not the crying when you lose your job or when you make an accident and lose your car. No, it's the crying when you are by yourself and remember Allah and you find the tears coming down from your eyes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to teach us that two types of eyes will not be touched by hellfire. One of them is an eye that remembers Allah, meaning the owner of the eye, meaning the human being. When he remembers Allah by himself alone, without anyone beside him, without anyone watching him, he remembers Allah and he cries, this is the eye that will not be touched by the fire of hell. And the other one is the eye that keeps guarding this great religion. The eye that's all the time working day and night in order to protect this religion and to spread this religion to others. The owner of these eyes will not be touched by hellfire. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, at the end of this verse, this is the guidance of Allah, meaning the love of the Qur'an and being affected by the words of the Qur'an is a science, as a sign for all of us that it is a guidance from Almighty Allah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah, Dr. Mamdou Muhammad, for your very interesting and well exemplified talk on the topic impact of the Quran on the hearts. Now we would have the question and answer session. We would request you to kindly state your name and profession before putting forward your question to get a more appropriate response. Now, yes, brother. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Tariq and I'm a student by profession. Sir, uh, in Quran, there comes a verse where uh, it says that I swear of the uh, moon and the star. Once I was chatting on net, uh, one of my friends, who I don't know much about him, he was Yehudi, in instantly said uh, that, okay, if uh, Quran is a heavenly book, I said, yeah, it's a heavenly book. It is written by Almighty Allah. So he again no, asked It was me, not written by, it was spoken by Allah, by the way. Okay. Not written, well, okay. Sorry. Okay, good. It was spoken by Allah. So he asked me, if it is so, your uh, Allah is uh, mightier than everyone. So why, he, he must be why mightier than the sun and the moon and the stars also. I said, yeah, he is definitely mightier. So he then said uh, that, so why he is swearing of the uh, moon and the stars? So please let me understand this. Very good. I think this is a very good question for two reasons. The first reason, it's based on the logic of the mind. If Allah is stronger than what he swears by, why should he do this? Okay? So that is based on intellect and logic and rational, which is very good. At the same time, a lot of Muslims nowadays, some of the Muslims, I wouldn't say a lot, the number is decreasing dr dramatically is that they are swearing by others than Allah, okay? So it's important for two reasons, the first reason and the second reason. Now let me elaborate. First, first, you have to understand this quality about Allah. No one on earth has the right to question Allah. You have to establish this in your mind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of his qualities is that he, la yus'al amma yaf'al. Allah is the owner of this whole universe. He is the one who brought it into existence. He has full freedom to do whatever he wants. Whatever. Because if somebody questions Almighty Allah, he would put himself on the same level of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to question him. Who are you to question him? I bought this tie. I have the right to tie it this way or in a different way. 
to put it in my pocket or to put it in my bag. I am the one who bought it. I have full control on it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has full control of the universe. So whatever he does, it is his wisdom. We don't have the right to do this. However, we Muslims have the right to search this matter and to look for the wisdom of Allah. But we don't have the right to question him. Why did you do this? Or why do you do this? We don't have this right. Right? Because this makes us superior or the same level or more superior than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala azza wa ta'ala. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should not be questioned of what, about what he does. Let me teach you something what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa did. You notice there are many verses in the Quran that start with قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ So in other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, say to the people, right, هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ He is one. As if I am asking him, say to the people, I will be absent tomorrow. What would you say? Tell them. I would say Dr. Mamdu Muhammad would be absent tomorrow. Very good. Very good. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Muhammad, tell the people that he is one. He didn't tell the people he is one. He said, Qul. He said, Allah is one. Do you understand what I'm saying? He was literal to the word. He repeated the word say, although it doesn't make sense to say it. When the Prophet ﷺ was asked this subtle question, why do you say, say, who Allah Ahad? You should say, who Allah Ahad only. He said, I would never, ever change a single word that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. Brothers and sisters, this is the highest level of ubudiyya, to be a lover and worshiper and a slave and servant of Allah. You do what he wants, not what you think that is correct. This is the problem. When we use our rational, irrationally, in the areas of divinity, we can use our brains rationally in any other area except the area of divinity. Whatever belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should not put ourselves there and question him. Rather, we should look for the answer, okay? Now, it's very important, especially for the educated people, the most educated ones, the PhD holders and the master's holders and the doctors and the engineers, and the more you are educated in the types of education that we get nowadays, the more you are vulnerable to such questions. Let me go back to the issue. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the right to swear by anything He created. But He gave us only one right to swear only by what? By Him. Because He is the greatest. We cannot swear by any other thing. We can only swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is one thing. But He, in order to tell us that this issue is so significant and important, Allah swears by His own creation. The creation of the sun, the creation of the moon, the creation of duha, the creation of night, the creation of day, and everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created. He, to tell you that this is something very important and you need to reflect upon it, how many times have you reflected upon the creation of the sun? Have you ever seen a day without a sun? You may say yes. No. Have you ever seen a day without the sun? No. No. The sun is there, but the clouds is, <laughs> is covering. Every day you can see the consistency of what happens. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you this is something very great. So Allah has the right to swear by His creation. We don't have this right. We only are allowed by Allah to swear by Him, not by His creatures, because they are inferior than Allah. However, Allah, because He is the owner of these things, He is the owner, so He has the right. He had been given to Him Himself. I hope I answered the question. Thank you, sir. Zakallahu khairan.
by the way, these questions are very good. You need to think of them, and also as well you need to know the wisdom behind that, because you will be asked the same questions every day. Question, brothers, sisters? My name is Shumaila. I'm a student. I'm asking this question on behalf of Sister Rumi, who is a homemaker. Brother Muhammad, you just mentioned that an eye that sheds tears when all alone is an eye that will not be touched by hellfire. Please tell me what will happen with me, as I often find myself crying even when there are people around. Is this hypocrisy, that is, crying in public? No, not at all. I was recording yesterday in the studio. I was explaining one of the verses in the Quran. It is the scene, I call it the graduation scene. It's the scene that every one of us will take his book, either by his right hand or by his left hand. When I reached this level, I could not control myself. And I cried in front of all the audience. So it's not a sign of hypocrisy at all. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu encourage us to reflect upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we are by ourselves. But it is not a sign of hypocrisy and people may envy you because you have this quality. Al Hassan al Basri he is one of the Tabi'een, the second generation. He used to tell some of his friends, let's cry. If we don't cry in this dunya, what should we do instead of crying? He said that if you don't remember Allah and you recite the Quran and you cry at this time, when are you going to use these tears that Allah created on you? And if you don't, your heart will stiffen and will become tougher and harder. So it's not a bad sign at all, but the Prophet Sallallahu encourages us to reflect upon Allah and His verses when we are by ourselves. Zakallah khair. Again, this is a very beautiful question. My name is Janardhan V. Garbil. I am a Vedanti, uh, other called Hindu. And uh, what I ask you that any man who go up to that level, up to Poyangambar level or that, prophet level, he, what he will sing, that is song, that is our experience, because uh, Jnaneshwar, Tukaram, like sun sends uh, born in this soil. Do you agree with that? By the way, if you are planning to go to the level of the prophets, Allah will select you and will tell us about you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selected Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be the messenger and to be the last messenger. And had Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selected another one, huh? he would tell us about him so we would follow him. But the last one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us about was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So nobody is going to reach the level of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is part of our belief. Nobody's going to be a messenger. Otherwise, why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us that Muhammad is the last messenger? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, does Allah deceive us? Of course not. So nobody is going to be a messenger or a prophet after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So just a correction of the, what you said. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum wa wa rahmatullah. Jazakallah, Brother Mamdou Muhammad, for this wonderful lecture. Alhamdulillah. Uh, I am a media student. My name is Abdullah Danish. And uh, in, during the course of my studies, I come across a variety of theories as well as some uh, understanding, like, for example, the, the evolution of language and things like that, which contradict what is the teaching of the Quran. So while I'm reading that, okay, so um, am I wasting my time? Because I'm in the process of, of obtaining a degree. So am I wasting my time in that process? Definitely not. Because it goes against the teachings of the Quran and I have... No, but when you study it, when Dr. Zakir Naik and others who are interested in comparative religion, when they study other books, it's not a waste of time even if they are against the Quran because they needed to refute the people who have made these theories 
and to the people who are seeking the truth. So it's very essential for you, but not for everyone, because this is the, your area of expertise. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. But also the issue of the evolution of the language. Because it's in Surah Ar-Rahman, uh, so it goes against that, that concept, because they say... Why? The evolution of language, they believe it was man, it started with paintings in the caves and like monkeys uh, yes, saying even, things and like even that. Even if it is paintings in the caves and even if it is some sounds by an, this doesn't mean because there is similarity between the sounds. Even that this is not a dangerous issue as the evolution of man. This is totally against Islam. But the evolution of language is something that needs some research to prove that. It's a good area to study in and to tell us what did you find, inshallah? Zakallahu khair. Barakallahu fi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum salam. Brother, I would like to ask you a question. As in many places in the Quran, it is said, reflect on its verses. So, how can we reflect, or what are the methods on which basically we can concentrate so that we can reflect on the Quran? Very good. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al Imran and in many verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us to reflect upon the creation of the heavens and the earth and what is in between them. A lot of people would open a magazine and would see how beautiful this BMW is and would start spending a couple of hours to know all the details of the BMW car or the Mercedes car or whatever other car. So they spend their time doing this. We want you to change the shift of focus. And instead of focusing on the creation of man, what man had manufactured, reflect upon, just I want to tell you something. See how the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how many times have you looked into yourself and you discovered that you have in your body three trillion living machines three trillion machines moving in your body with such accuracy when you just reflect upon this what is the response that you are going to say tell me subhanallah just in every one of us the number of machines and they are living machines they are not dead machines because machines work and do not work but these machines are working continuously three trillion machines more than the number of machines in the whole of India in your body doesn't this require from you to say subhanallah or alhamdulillah for this blessing yes it does so that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to reflect upon to reflect upon everything look at all these trees and the leaves that come from them every leaf on the tree falls down the time of the falling down is recorded by the angels what would you say Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar and you prostrate to Allah thanking him that he guided you to be a Muslim and to know that this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us to reflect upon these things and the best thing, by the way, studying science from this perspective helps you a lot to understand the creation, some of the significance of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what the word reflection means here. In other words, not reflection in man-made issues, things, but in divine-made created things. Jazakallah, Dr. Mamdou Muhammad. We thank you for being present with us. And uh, it was an honor for us to have a different understanding in a very exemplified manner about students. And I think our audience has been impressed. Inshallah, we'll have you come back to us on the other talks Inshallah. for the programs. And now we would request our audience to kindly appreciate the talk we have heard of Dr. Mamdu Muhammad with a takbir. Allahu Akbar. Allah.
جزاكم الله خير السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته